welcome everybody to the latest in our live and taking event series, um, where each month we, we are delighted to bring you the latest BHF news and pioneering research stories. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, my name is Nilesh Samani, I'm medical director of the British Heart Foundation. As some of you know, this year marks six de decades of, since the BHF was formed. We've come so far since then, and I'm immensely proud of it to have funded some of the world's greatest cardiovascular breakthroughs through research. One area we are particularly proud of is the research we funded on the prevention and treatment of coronary heart disease and heart attacks. And that really brings me to the topic of today's discussion, the BHS research on statins, perhaps the most widely used drugs in the world. As many of you who've been to these meetings before know, the format is very similar. We have two guest speakers, which I'll introduce in a moment, and then plenty of time for you to ask us any questions that you that you have. But before I introduce our guest speakers today, uh, let me put a, two or three just questions to you just to see where we are in terms of your understanding of statins. So uh, team, can you just put up the first poll question on the screen? Um, when we, uh, the question is, when were statins first widely used clinically? Um, do people know that? It was in the 70s, 80s, or 90s. Good. Um, so the correct answer is actually the one that was chosen most. It, it is in the 1990s. They, they came in, you know, research was being done in the 80s on statins, but really they came into clinical use after the evidence, some of which you'll hear this afternoon, was, was created in, in the early 1990s. Let's go to the second question. Uh, and this is more personal to all of you. Just want to know uh, how much of our audience do you, do you take a statin? Uh, and just see where we are with this. I can tell you because both Professor Collins, Rory Collins and I, I tell you, we both take a statin, so you should, just so you know. Ah, an equal, almost an equal split uh, between those who do and those who don't. So that, that's very interesting. And I hope that will raise some questions when we come to the question and answer session. And finally, um, uh, a further question, which is about whether you, you have an understanding of how many adults in the UK take, stat take statins at the moment. I would guess. Okay, um, the correct answer is 8 million. So it's, it is, it, you know, it's a significant proportion of the adult population in the UK who, who, who take a statin. As I said earlier, it's probably the widest used drug uh, in, 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 in class of drugs in, in the world. And what we're going to discuss today is, is really the BHF's contribution to the evidence uh, that has um, uh, brought, uh, created statins as, as, as being so widely used. And for that, I'm really pleased that our main speaker for, for today is Professor Sir Rory Collins, who is BHF Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology at the University of Oxford. As you'll hear from Rory's presentation, he has really led some of the key studies that have established statins for their use in cardiovascular medicine and saved hundreds of thousands of lives around the world. We'll then also be joined by Jan, Jan, Jan Barton Wolf, who, is, who will talk about a person story about her heart and circulatory problem and her experience of taking statins. So Jan, very welcome uh, to, to, to this session. In the question and answer session at the end of the meeting, we'll be joined by Regina Giblin, who is one of our senior cardiac nurse, who will take some of the questions that you may have to ask. So without further ado, I would like to pass on to Professor Sir Rory Collins to give his presentation on, on his work on statins. Welcome, Rory. Thank you very much, um, Nilesh, and uh, to colleagues at the British Heart Foundation. I hope you can see my slides and, and hear me now. Um, it, it's a great privilege, actually, to, to speak to you today and to, to thank you for your contributions to the British Heart Foundation. Uh, in this month, 40 years ago, I uh, came to Oxford to start research and pretty much for all of that period, I have been supported in one way or another by the British Heart Foundation in my research. What I'd like to do is to describe to you the work that has gone on, much of it supported as Nilesh has said by the British Heart Foundation into the statins and how important that has been, not only in 
leading to a much wider use of statins to prevent, prevent heart attacks and strokes in people, but also greater understanding of how to reduce risk in people uh, who are at risk of cardiovascular disease. So my talk is entitled Statin Drugs, the answer to the question about the safety and benefits of lowering blood cholesterol levels in the population, which as I'll try to illustrate, goes way beyond even the enormous impact of the statin drugs themselves. So what is the evidence for the benefits of lowering cholesterol levels with statins and how might that be relevant to other ways of lowering uh, cholesterol? Well, first of all, many decades ago, it was shown that higher blood levels of blood cholesterol are associated with higher risks of developing coronary heart disease. On this graph here, we see the association between the risk of coronary heart disease uh, on the vertical axis and the cholesterol level in different populations around the world on the horizontal axis. Up in the top right hand corner in Finland, the, the F, high cholesterol level, this is in old units of milligrams per deciliter, this is about six millimoles of cholesterol, uh, is associated with a high risk of coronary artery disease compared with people down here, the J for Japan, uh, where they have lower cholesterol levels, 160 or four millimoles in the new units and levels of cholesterol that are one quarter of those in Finland at that time. And indeed work that we did in China showed that the average cholesterols were more like 120 or three millimoles per liter and the risks were even lower. But of course, different populations, different, different, lots of different ways. And so we can't be sure that that difference in risk is due to the difference in cholesterol. And it's better to look within populations to see whether you see the same association. And this is work we did bringing together many different studies from many populations around the world, again, supported by the British Heart Foundation, combining studies within populations where people had their cholesterol measured and then were followed uh, for uh, more than 10 years, showing again, even within a population that higher levels of cholesterol are associated with higher risks of disease, both among people at younger ages, but also importantly, among people at older ages. And throughout the range of cholesterol studied, lower cholesterol was associated with lower risk of coronary heart disease. But that doesn't mean necessarily that lowering blood levels of cholesterol, and in particular, a so-called bad LDL or low density lipoprotein cholesterol uh, will lower the risk of heart attacks and strokes. And indeed, studies that were done more than 20 years ago of drugs prior to the statins and indeed diets that lower cholesterol failed to show that lowering LDL cholesterol was beneficial. The reason why we think that is the case is that those drugs and diets did not lower cholesterol very much. And so they may not have been able to detect the benefits of lowering LDL cholesterol. And at this point, I'd like to ask you the question, how big a reduction in cholesterol, in LDL cholesterol, do you think the statins produce? Five to 10%, 10 to 20%, or 25 to 50%? So some of you uh, think just five to 10%, but the majority either think it's 10 to 20 or 25 to 50%. Well, in fact, statins can reduce LDL cholesterol by somewhere between 25 and 50%. The first generation of drugs by about 25%, but as, the companies improve the efficacy of the drugs, we now get a 50% reduction in LDL cholesterol. And that ability to lower cholesterol very substantially made it possible to demonstrate the efficacy and safety of lowering LDL cholesterol. Here's a table that comes from the NHS, from uh, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, that shows the original, the first class of drugs, such as simvastatin, uh, and they reduced cholesterol from somewhere between 
and about 37% in the doses now currently used. But the newer drugs, atorvastatin and rosuvastatin, produce even bigger reductions, about a, a halving even more in LDL cholesterol. And all of these drugs now are generic, so they're very, very cost effective for the health service. And a large number of randomized controlled trials were done, which showed that each one millimole reduction in LDL cholesterol lowered the risk of heart attacks and strokes by about one quarter in every year that treatment continued. After the first, it takes a little while before you see the full benefit, but then as treatment continues, you lower the risk of a heart attack and stroke by 25%, and the longer you continue treatment, the bigger the benefit that you get. Here's the evidence for that, and this is a paper that we published in 2010, where again, with support from the British Heart Foundation, we brought together uh, all of the data from the large long-term randomized trials of statin therapy, 26 trials, of 130,000 patients where we got individual data from collaborating uh, researchers around the world. On average, there was a reduction of about one millimole in cholesterol uh, in those trials and treatment continued for five years. And here, what I'm plotting is the reduction in the risk of major vascular events by which I mean heart attacks, strokes, and the need for revascularization surgery or procedures plotted on the vertical axis against the size of the reduction in LDL cholesterol. So the first of these studies was this one here, the 4S study from Scandinavia, where there was a big reduction in LDL cholesterol in high-risk patients and a big reduction in risk. And the bigger the reduction in LDL cholesterol, the bigger the reduction in risk. And I'm just highlighting the British Heart Foundation MRC heart protection trial which is a study that we conducted out of Oxford, but involved hospitals across the UK. It's the largest trial of statins ever done, 20,000 UK patients. Um, and if it were not for the first funding that came in from the British Heart Foundation, who pledged a million pounds towards this trial, it would never have been done. That leveraged about 20 billion pounds from the Medical Research Council and from industry that helped this trial to generate the most reliable evidence about statins that we have uh, from anywhere else in the world. It was able, because it was so big, to demonstrate the safety of statins on many different outcomes, but also to demonstrate that lowering LDL cholesterol with a statin was beneficial, not just for middle-aged people, but for older people, not just for men, but also for women, not just for people with high cholesterol, but also for those with lower cholesterol levels who are at high risk and beneficial not just for those who'd already had heart attacks or strokes, but also people who had diabetes. So this was an incredibly important trial, and as I say, would not have occurred uh, without the British Heart Foundation. So what we saw in those trials of statin versus control, that with a one millimole reduction in LDL cholesterol, there was a a reduction of about 22% over the five year period, less in the first year, and then about a quarter in the subsequent years. But then there were a series of additional trials of more intensive statin versus standard statin. Five trials involving 40,000 patients. Again, the biggest of those trials was a search trial with support from the British Heart Foundation that we conducted across the UK. A further half a millimole reduction in cholesterol, uh, again, on average for about five years. And what we found was that additional reduction in LDL cholesterol produced an additional reduction in the risk of coronary artery disease. So whereas one millimole reduction produced a 22% reduction in risk, a one and a half millimole reduction produced a reduction in risk of about one third. And indeed further studies have shown that if you lower LDL cholesterol even more, say by two millimoles, then you reduce risk of heart attacks, strokes, or revascularizations by about 40%. What does that mean in absolute terms? So if we take somebody who on average has an LDL cholesterol of four, and with an effective statin regimen, say a torvastatin 40 milligrams, which is what I take, you can halve that LDL cholesterol. Uh, then among 10,000 people, 
treated for five years. Those who have already had a heart attack or stroke, that is secondary prevention, a thousand of them will avoid one or more of these major vascular events that could be disabling or fatal. And even, even in the primary prevention setting, so uh, people like me, who've not already uh, developed uh, heart disease, using a statin for five years, 500 of 10,000 will avoid one or more of events. And if you go on for 10 years, those numbers will double. So the use of a statin on average will halve the risk of these life-threatening and disabling vascular events. Another study that uh, had major British Heart Foundation support is a study done in Scotland, the WASCOP study, where five years of statin therapy was used in prime prevention. So these were in people who were thought to be healthy. Uh, so what this graph shows is that during the five years of treatment, there was a, a reduction in the risk of heart failure or stroke or coronary artery disease, CHD, or the need for coronary artery bypass grafting, coronary artery surgery or primary uh, uh, or, or, or uh, an angioplasty to open up the arteries. But interestingly, after the treatment stopped with continued follow-up, the benefits continued to emerge. So five years of treatment was producing very substantial long-term benefits. And, and this was a very nice example, not only of the importance of statins, but also the ability to link into health record systems in Scotland to show how these benefits were getting bigger and bigger over time. But as I mentioned, the randomized trials also showed that statins are very safe and well tolerated. There is really only one major complication of statins, and it's this very rare complication called myopathy, uh, muscle problems where people get muscle pain or weakness, but associated with uh, an increase in the release of muscle, the muscle enzyme creating kinase into the blood. But it is, as I say, very, very rare, about one per 10,000 patients per year would get this. And the trials that we've done have shown that the risk is influenced by the dose of the statin. So for example, the SEARCH trial that we did of 40 versus 80 milligrams of simvastatin showed that 80 milligrams of simvastatin was associated with much higher risk of myopathy. And as a consequence of that trial, BHF supported trial, the NHS changed their guidance and uh, uh, did not, has not gone on to use 80 milligrams of simvastatin, but has instead encouraged people to use a torvastatin uh, to get a big reduction in cholesterol. And uh, that trial also showed certain uh, uh, interactions with other drugs that are used for heart disease. But in general, this is a very, very rare complication. And it's easy to determine whether it's occurring because you can measure the uh, enzyme in the blood. And doctors can do that if someone has muscle problems. However, because of this concern about this rare complication, doctors do tell patients when they start a statin that they might get muscle symptoms. And as a consequence, they're alerted to attributing muscle symptoms to the drug. And often the muscle symptoms have nothing to do with the drug. This is demonstrated rather beautifully in the heart protection study. So here are the 20,000 patients and at each visit, the clinic nurses were asking the patients, have you had muscle pain or weakness? And you can see that early on, because at the beginning, they were told that the, the drugs might cause muscle problems. People were reporting them very, very commonly. And then as time went by, less and less commonly. But th there was no difference in the reporting rate among people taking the actual drug, the statin, or those taking a dummy tablet. So most of the, uh, the attribution of muscle pain and weakness when people taking statins is, be, is a misattribution. They're attributing the aches and pains of getting older, which we all face, I'm afraid, uh, to the drug when it's not actually the drug that's causing it. Here's a study, um, uh, another study. This is a study using one of the newer drugs, resuvastatin, that I mentioned. And again, you can see the same thing, that muscle symptoms are reported equally commonly 
among patients who are taking the dummy placebo tablets, the blinded control, as among those who are taking the active treatment. And this study looked very, very carefully uh, with this new statin, very intensive statin, it lowered LDL cholesterol by uh, about 50%. Uh, in an elderly, frail population with heart failure, they still saw no adverse effects uh, in terms of these muscle symptoms. And most recently, the British Heart Foundation funded a study that was done by uh, Liam Smith in London and colleagues, where they took patients who had reported that they, they had serious muscle problems when they took statins and who uh, were planning to stop their statin because of this, or they had already stopped. And what they did very cleverly was that they took these patients and they got them to agree to taking either a statin or placebo over a period of a year. So for three periods, they had statin, three periods they had placebo in a random order. And then they said, were they getting muscle problems? So these were the people who really, really thought that the statin caused muscle problems. And even among them, the rate of getting muscle problems when you're actually taking a statin was identical to the, muscle, the, the rate of, of reporting muscle problems when they were getting placebo. So even in this very sensitized population where you might have anticipated that it really was due to the drug, uh, it was misattribution. Another very nice piece of work supported by the British Heart Foundation. So I've described the benefits and here in summary are you the, the, the kind of the, the adverse effects of statins per 10,000 people treated. It is definitely the case about five per 10,000 would get this rare complication of myopathy. But contrast that with the 1,000 to 500 who avoid heart attack strokes or revascularizations. We do think that there may be an increase in the risk of strokes due to bleeding. But bear in mind, there's a much bigger absolute reduction in strokes due to blood clots, as well as uh, heart attacks and revascularizations. Statins are associated with an increase in the di diagnosis of diabetes, but the main concerns about diabetes are increases in the risk of heart attacks and strokes, and statins reduce those risks. The other concern is increases in the risk of what we call microvascular complications. Uh, small vessel complications in the kidney uh, or in the eye. And very, very careful studies have shown that statins have no adverse effects on the kidney or, or eye uh, problems. So uh, I think at most, um, there might be 50 to 100 more muscle pain or weakness associated with statins, but I think that that is potentially an overestimate. And again, balanced against preventing 500 to 1,000 per 10,000 fewer major vascular events. The large-scale randomized evidence also rules out material excesses of any other adverse outcomes, whether that be on dementia or cognitive function, sleep disorders, mood disorders. There is no evidence whatsoever of any adverse consequences there. I just want to end with one final slide on the future. I focused on statins, but there is a new uh, game in town, which I think is very, very exciting. Uh, there is a, a protein called PCSK9 in the blood. And the PCSK9 in the blood, which is produced within the liver cells, actually combines with the LDL receptors on the surface of liver cells that pull LDL cholesterol out of the blood, where it's metabolized in the liver, um, and reduces LDL cholesterol. Statins work by increasing the number of LDL receptors on the cell surface. They can make somebody with familial hypercholesterolemia have double the number of receptors uh, that they would have in order to help reduce their LDL cholesterol. PCSK9 combines with these LDL receptors and makes them uh, not available for uh, pulling cholesterol out of the blood. Some very clever chemists have designed a small molecule called inclisiran that you can inject under the skin one to two times a year. And that blocks 
the production of this protein within the liver cell, reduces the amount of the protein in the blood, and as a consequence, allows there to be more LDL receptors on the cell surface, lowering cholesterol very substantially by another 50% on top of a statin with an injection every six months or even a year. So there is the potential, I think, uh, within the next few years of uh, what you might call vaccination against uh, coronary artery disease that could be of great value for lowering cholesterol, particularly in younger individuals uh, who are not yet ready to be taking a tablet every day. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk to you. Um, any of you who might be look, interested in looking at this in more detail, uh, this is a paper that we published in the Lancet in November 2016 that went into great detail on the efficacy and safety of statin therapy. And the second author, Christina Reith, uh, is now doing uh, work funded by the British Heart Foundation to look into even more detail at the uh, safety of statins in order to help reassure the public patients and of course the medical profession about their safety as well as efficacy. Thank you very, very much. Rory, that was terrific. Uh, thank, thank you so much for a very clear, clear presentation and I'm sure it'll, be, it'll, it'll provoke some questions uh, towards the end. So people should be thinking about the questions they, they wish to ask Professor Collins. Um, maybe you can take your slides off so we can we can move on to the next uh, uh, next bit of presentation. Um, Rory, you, did, you didn't touch upon there are obviously many reasons why people's cholesterol goes up. You know, part of it may be diet, and to some extent, you know, changing diet may help. And Regina might want to comment on it a bit bit later. But a lot of it is 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 inherited, and you know, we all possess genes that uh, that make our liver make more cholesterol. That's the reason people's cholesterol varies. In the, in the blood so much, and some people have high cholesterol. But there's a particularly rare form of hypercholesterolemia called familial hypercholesterolemia, which affects one in 250 families in the UK. And these, these families are a particularly high risk of, of coronary heart disease. And identifying these families is very important because of this, this elevated risk. So I'm really delighted today that our second speaker is somebody who does have this issue in the family. And Jan Barton Wolf has very kindly agreed to tell us about her, her, her story and her family story related to uh, familiar hypercholesterolemia. Welcome, Jan. Hello, well, um, thank you for inviting me to join you this afternoon um, and, it, and discuss and talk about my experience with statins. Um, if I go back, I've always thought that uh, I was really fit and healthy and I worked out most days, ran and um, had a healthy diet. So never in a million years did I think that I had uh, something wrong with me. Um, back in, uh, and I say also my family, there was nothing really in my family that sort of highlighted any issues, but it all changed in 2011 when my young cousin at age 20 died. Um, totally out of the blue, unexpected. I mean, 10 months previous, we had been at her wedding and she had a beautiful uh, baby girl. Um, total devastation through the family. She'd had a heart attack. Um, and again, we, it, it took a while for us to sort of accept what had happened, but we did and we carried on our lives. And then um, we were called forward to have some testing because they uh, had established that um, Kate had died of something called FH, hyperfamilial cholesterol anemia. Um, and being a hereditary condition, they decided to call my family forward. Um, my family's quite a big family, there's 32 of us. Um, sadly, 16 of us have come back positive with the defective gene, and that includes myself and my two daughters. Um, again, total devastation through the family because you kind of think you've got this health condition. I've lost a young cousin. I've got two young daughters. Um, my life was just, it's shock, absolute shock. However, um, a few visits to the hospitals and um, some further tests, and I was put on statins back in 2017. Um, I can honestly say that I haven't changed my lifestyle as such. I just take a tablet every single day now. Um, obviously on the outside I look and feel the same but inside my cholesterol has reduced drastically or dramatically I should say um, 
and I continue living my life to the full. Um, I don't have an issue taking statins. It's never caused me any side effects or anything. And I still continue to run four or five terms a week with my six dogs. So life for me still continues despite being on statins and despite having this, um, this defective gene, which is hopefully under control now with the, um, the statins reducing my cholesterol. Thank you very much, Jan, for, for, for sharing your, your family story. I, I think I should have probably said also that, you know, the gene test that you had done, you know, the genetic test to show that you've got this uh, mutation in a gene that causes familial hypercholesterolemia. Also, a lot of that work, as Rory will tell you, was funded by the British Heart Foundation. So one of our other BHF professors at the University College London, Professor Steve Humphreys, discovered many of the mutations that were responsible for FH and really set up the clinical practice of screening families for, for, for FH. So, you know, there's a really big push at the moment in the UK because this is quite common as an inherited disease condition. You know, one in 250 families we suspect has FH that, that we should be screening more families. There are lots of people out there with familial hypercholesteremia with, with, a, with a family history that's even more devastating than yours where, where this thing isn't being offered at the moment and people are unaware that they're at risk. So this is something that the BHF is trying to improve as well. But your story, really, thank you for sharing your story, and, and I'm pleased that you're you're doing well. And I can see the exercise bike in the background, so that's 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 good to see as well. Yeah. Um, so I think we, I think we've I, I, I'm sure people have been impressed by the two presentations I've heard today, uh, and we now have enough time, really, for questions um, to take, which is really the best, you know, in the sense the best part of the afternoon to hear your questions and, and try to answer them. Um, we're joined, joined for this, as I said earlier, by Regina Giblin, who is, who is a senior cardiac nurse at the BHF, who, 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 who helps with these, uh, who will help answer the questions. So, Leanne, over to you now and to, to, to see what questions we've received. Uh, I see some of them in the chat bar, but perhaps you can, you can read them out for us. Thank you, Nunesh, and thank you, Professor Collins and Jen, for sharing your, your talks and your stories with us. They found them really, really inspiring. And I think so, so have our audience, because we've received quite a few questions. Um, and the first one is for um, Professor Collins. So the question is, what are your thoughts on the publicity questioning statins causing dementia? Well, as I, I mentioned um, in my talk, the data that we have so far um, from the large-scale randomized trial shows that they're incredibly effective at lowering the risk of heart attacks, strokes, and revascularizations. But there isn't very much evidence of any further either beneficial or adverse effects. So there's no evidence of adverse effects on cognitive function or dementia. And this has been studied very, very carefully, both with questionnaire assessments, um, and even with imaging data, uh, there's nothing to show that um, statins have either adverse or beneficial effects on, on cognition or dementia or, or, or brain function in any way. Thank you, Rory, thank you. Um, so the next question is for you as well, and it's about whether there is a link between statins and COVID-19 mortality. What can you tell us about, about that link? Not that we can see, no evidence that the, the use of statins is either protective or adverse. Although we, we are aware that people who are at high risk of cardiovascular disease, either through obesity, diabetes, um, are at higher risk from COVID-19, but statins themselves do not seem to be relevant to uh, complications associated with COVID-19. Mm. Leanne, can I just add to that? Because um, uh, there was also worry, right, as Rory will, will remember that when, when COVID-19 hit us last year, there was also worry initially that maybe people were taking other cardiovascular drugs may be at higher risk as well. There's a worry particularly about antihypertensive drugs and, and particularly ACE inhibitors. And that also turned out not to be the case. You know, there was a real worry in the in, in, in fund research that we funded by the BHF and others looked at this question very urgently and found no evidence that, that taking those antihypertensive drugs uh, increase your risk of an adverse effect from COVID-19. So hopefully that sort of reassured people as well. So I think this is the same price to statins, but that was also a concern early on. 
Yeah, I think it's a very important point is to understanding causation yeah. that um, the people who have underlying health conditions that result in them getting either a statin or getting um, um, antihypertensive treatment are, are at higher risk, but that not the drug is not causing the higher risk. It's the underlying health condition. Thank you both. That's that's good to know. Um, Regina, thank you for so much for, for joining us to the Q&A session part of this event. So Regina, is, as Nilesh said, is our senior cardiac nurse at the BHF. And we have a few questions for you. So the first question is, so someone said, I had atrial fibrillation and following a TIA, I had an ablation, which was successful. I have been taking atorvastatin now for six years. I have not had any heart trouble over that time. Should I continue to take that statin? Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, firstly, uh, to the person who posed the question, I'm glad to hear that your ablation was successful and that you haven't had any, any heart issues over the last while. Um, the short answer to your question is yes, I would recommend that you continue take, to take your statins. Uh, statins are prescribed for different reasons. Sometimes they're prescribed on the long term use for people who've already had a cardiovascular event, such as heart attack or stroke, and sometimes they're prescribed for people who are at risk of having um, a cardiovascular event, such as heart attacks or stroke. So people who already have an existing uh, cardiac condition, such as heart failure or familial hypercholesterolemia, as described by Jan earlier, and, and also atrial fibrillation. Um, and statins only work uh, so long as you take them. So people that already have high cholesterol in their, in their blood, um, once you stop taking the, the tablets, the, the cholesterol level can, can, can start to rise. Um, and the other thing I would say is um, with regards to stopping any medications or making any changes, we would advise you to speak to your prescribing doctor um, to talk about the risk benefits of staying on the medications and what other alternatives there may be. Thank you, Regina. We have another question for you, and it's about whether you can take statins if, if you're pregnant. So someone who's pregnant asked us that question. Um, uh, the short answer is no. Uh, we don't advise uh, people that are women that are pregnant, um, we, we advise them to stop taking their medications before conception of up to three months if possible. Um, that is so that the statins have flushed out of your body. Um, if you become pregnant and you're on statins and let your specialist know as soon as possible, there is a small risk um, to the unborn child that statins may, may uh, transfer across the placenta. Um, you know, so therefore that's why they're not um, prescribed during pregnancy. Um, if you're concerned that you have high cholesterol and you're pregnant, then please speak to your, your specialist in the lipid clinic as well as your uh, maternity services. Thank you, Regina. And so this is actually it's an interesting question. So are statins the only way to lower cholesterol? And someone asked, how else can I lower my cholesterol? Is it just through statins or can I do something else? Uh, so... There are, there are supplementary ways in your and having a healthy lifestyle, making some healthy choices, as well as taking statins. There are some people who will have to do both, take the statins as well as do some healthy, healthy things within their lifestyle. So the lifestyle things would be um, to have a well-balanced diet, to make some healthy choices with diet. I'll, I'll discuss that a bit more because there's another question coming through about the changes um, with, with, with what foods you should choose to lower your cholesterol. It's important to have a... a a good weight that's that's within your BMI, um, and to and to be in shape, to take lots of um, activity such as exercise. We we advise people to exercise up to 150 minutes of moderate type exercise. Um, you can break that up within the week. You don't have to do 150 minutes all at once. Um, so making small changes in your lifestyle to become more active, the walking your dog or you know running up the stairs, things like that to do it within your everyday life. Um, exercise helps to uh, move the blood along through your body, which helps to get the liver um, to get rid of the cholesterol. Uh, uh, stopping smoking is a good idea as well because um, smoking makes the arteries quite sticky and, and, and if there's high cholesterol there, it will stick to the inside of the arteries, therefore increasing your risk of heart attacks or strokes. Um, what was the other? Um, uh, I said, oh, reducing alcohol, uh, alcohol every week as well because it reduces the workload of the liver and... Um, Therefore, you know, that helps get rid of the bad cholesterol within your blood as well. And yeah, on, on, thank you. And on that note, um, what foods 
what type of foods lower cholesterol? Uh, so uh, I would say there's three main uh, strategies to take uh, to help lower your cholesterol. Uh, the first one would be is to make healthy choices with regards to fats in your diet. And the second would be to look at food la labels when you go shopping with, with regards to purchasing uh, different products. And the third thing would be is to increase fiber within your diet. So the first one with regards to is, is saturated fat. Uh, it, you can make simple swaps uh, to reduce the amount of saturated fat within your within your diet. So things like, um, you know, what oils you use, so using rapeseed oil, for example, um, uh, reduce the, the amount of high fat dairy products you have. So having um, like, uh, instead of high fat milk, have semi-skim milk, um, have lower fat uh, che cheeses instead of high fat cheeses. And, um, and think about processed foods as well, like not having processed meat or fatty meat and things like that. So these are some simple ways that small swaps you could make that actually can reduce your saturated fat within your diet and therefore help reduce your cholesterol. Um, the second thing was to look at your labels. So whenever you buy something in the supermarket, usually it has a traffic light system, green, amber and red. If the items are mostly green, then you know that that's a safer product to have. Um, with saturated fat, you want to look at it. Uh, you want to, the number to be 1.5 grams um, and 100 grams. If it's, if it's at one five, less than 1.5 grams, then you know it's a lower saturated fat product. Um, and also think about the size of the product, because sometimes the labels may say per 100 grams, but the actual size of the product is 500 grams. So obviously, if you eat the whole box of 500 grams, you're eating five times the amount of saturated fat. So that wouldn't be recommended. So it's also about portion size. And the third thing I was talking about was uh, increasing fiber. So fiber is uh, within um, lots of fruit and vegetables. We recommend uh, five portions a day of fruit and vegetables. So when you're having your dinner, for example, have half the plate, have the vegetables. That will really help get your fruit and vegetables within in your day. Um, other foods like whole grain, whole grain pasta, bread, cereal, rice, that also helps to increase fiber and um, also pulses such as beans, chickpeas, that type of thing. Increasing your fiber helps, um, so cholesterol is lowered within your, uh, the, the blood because the intestine um, will take, because if you have fiber within your intestine, it lowers uh, the amount of cholesterol that gets carried within your blood. So um, that was all the ways. Thank you, Regina. So basically a healthy lifestyle and not a lot of alcohol, and that's the way to, you know, uh, living, living a good life. That sounds like good advice to me. So thank you very much for, for sharing that with us. Um, Leanne, just on yeah? the question, I think there are some questions in here about um, why use statins, why not just use diet and, and the other approaches that uh, uh, Regina was mentioning. And they're not an either or. Uh, there's good evidence that uh, if you give a statin on top of um, uh, all of the, the approaches that uh, Regina mentioned, including, very importantly, stopping smoking if you do smoke, uh, that you lower risk further. And the additional question is, what else can you do in addition to a statin? Well, up till now, um, the available option was to add azetamide, uh, uh, which lowers LDL cholesterol by about 15 to 20% further, um, where the statin can halve the LDL cholesterol. Most recently, been de the development of the PCSK9 uh, inhibitors, which I touched on at the end. Until now, uh, the only way that has been um, targeted is using antibodies. Uh, so these are antibodies that are injected every couple of weeks uh, to mop up the protein, the PCSK9 protein. Uh, and they tend to be very expensive. So at the moment, they're really very restricted within the NHS and indeed other health uh, services uh, because they're expensive. And they're not very convenient because they have to be given it as injections uh, every couple of weeks. But they are very effective. They lower LDL cholesterol by another 50% on top of a statin uh, and lower the risk of cardiovascular events. What I'm hoping is that um, uh, the small molecule in glycerin, which only needs to be given as an injection every six months or even every year, uh, will be much more convenient. And potentially, 
because it's a small molecule rather than antibody, could be a, a much more cost-effective uh, treatment. Um, I should also mention that the statins are incredibly cheap, probably about five pounds per year, uh, because they're now not, they're out of patent, they're generic drugs, so they're very, very, very cost effective. Thank you, Rory, and thank you again, Regina. Um, we have a question for you, Rory, and it's, it's coming live just now, and it's about, obviously, we've been discussing the effects of statins on, on our hearts, but this person has asked, do statins have adverse effects elsewhere in the body? Apart from preventing uh, heart attacks and preventing strokes, um, really all we see is statins are preventing the furring up of the arteries, whether those are the arteries that supply the blood to the heart itself or the arteries that supply the blood to the brain uh, or other, other organs. Um, and there was one question, do statins kind of unfur the arteries? And uh, yes, they do. If you have very intensive statin therapy, not only do you slow the furring up, but you can actually reverse the furring up of, of the arteries. And the longer treatment continues, the, the, the bigger the benefits. But apart from that, we don't see any clear evidence of either beneficial or adverse effects of the statins on any other body system. That's what the individual trials show. The British Heart Foundation are currently supporting us to get individual data on every single uh, adverse event that occurred in these large scale trials so that we can look in even greater detail to see if uh, there is any signal coming through. But so far, um, I can say kind of in confidence, if you like, that uh, there's no evidence uh, of any effect other than the beneficial effect on the, the, the heart and the brain and, and other uh, vessels supplied by, um, other organs supplied by, by blood vessels. No adverse effects on, on the kidney. I, I did look in the question, someone was confusing creatine kinase, which is the muscle enzyme, with creatinine, which is the, um, the, 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 the protein that's related to the kidney. Um, uh, but there's no adverse effect on kidneys. Uh, in fact, we see some small benefit to kidneys because you improve the blood supply to the kidneys. Thanks, Rory. And is there an optimal level of LDL cholesterol and HDL cholesterol? Is, is there a danger of having too little? That's one of the questions that we've been asked. Well, one of the concerns, in fact, when the heart protection study was planned was, could you go too low? Um, and the heart protection study was the first study designed to test that question. And uh, we took all comers pretty much in the UK. And if they were at high risk because of heart disease, we looked at what happens if you lowered their LDL cholesterol. And there was benefit among people who already had existing cardiovascular disease if you lowered people who had a so-called high cholesterol. Um, and there was benefit among those who had an average cholesterol and even benefit among those in the, who had the lower third of LDL cholesterol in the UK population. Uh, I, I suppose the thing to say is there's no such thing as a normal Englishman or an English woman in terms of cholesterol. We all have humanly abnormal levels of LDL cholesterol. And the PCSK9 uh, inhibitor antibodies have allowed us to test that further because what they've done is they've taken people who are on intensive statin therapy and lowered their cholesterol by another 50% with the PCSK9 antibodies and showed even further reduction in the risk of cardiovascular events and no evidence of adverse uh, effects. So the data we have so far would suggest that you're having an LDL cholesterol down at about one uh, would be better than having it at two, uh, which would be better than having it at three or the, the UK kind of average of around four. Uh, there will be a lower level, um, but it's very, very difficult to, to achieve that. HDL cholesterol, typically the levels are about one or one and a half millimoles per liter, but we don't have any good evidence at all that increasing HDL cholesterol, so-called good cholesterol, actually uh, produces any beneficial effect in terms of risk reduction. Uh, so the, the main focus, I think, is lowering LDL cholesterol uh, and there's a, there was a question in the, the, the Q&A 
uh, from somebody saying, you know, I've got cardiovascular disease, but my cholesterol is not high. Why am I taking a cholesterol lowering drug? And I think the answer is actually your cholesterol is humanly high. Uh, if you were somebody living in rural China back in the, the, the 60s or 70s, you would have had a much lower cholesterol and a much lower risk of coronary artery disease. It's like saying, I only smoke 10 cigarettes a day. Uh, that's not very many. Uh, it, it, it's maybe average among smokers, uh, but it's still too many. Thanks, Rory. Mm -hmm. Just to add to what Rory has said, because there's a question in the chat from David McLeod, which, uh, which we should answer. Rory, which is that he's already got by, he's already had bypass surgery and was put on 20 milligrams of eight or since 2014 following a TIA and uh, has been left on that dose. Um, and he, his GP has wanted to move him to progressively higher doses up to 80 milligrams. And I think the answer to that question and really building on what you just said is that probably would, if you can tolerate the 80 milligrams, you're likely to get more benefit in the longer term of future events. So I think your GP is probably right in trying to, particularly given that you already had heart disease, to try and move you onto the highest dose. So David, I think you wanted to answer the question, you know, the lower the better, and the higher your dose of statin, provided you can tolerate it, would be a, a good strategy for you. Okay. Yeah, I think that was the, the point I was making in the talk, Nilesh, that um, uh, the, the NHS, mm. um, because simvastatin was very inexpensive, they encouraged the use of 80 milligrams of simvastatin, but then the, the BHS supported search trial yeah. showed that that was associated with an increased uh, risk of, of myopathy. So the recommendation was changed to moving to uh, atorvastatin or rosuvastatin, which are, are now generic drugs. Um, and the higher doses of those drugs are not associated with a material increase in the risk of myopathy. So um, uh, they, they are well tolerated uh, and the data really support that. And of course, for very high risk individuals who are taking high uh, dose of uh, statin, then the PCSK9 antibodies uh, are available. Um, to further reduce cholesterol and further reduce risk. Yeah, one of, one of, the, one of the colleagues also asked about whether they could go to the Insilaran. I don't think that's available just at the moment, but maybe after, you know, in a few years time, once the big, big trial year coordinates. I, I, th I think it will become available within probably the next year or so, even while the trial is going on. Right. And, and indeed, because the trial is being done in the UK, the NHS has negotiated with the company that the NHS will get it at a discounted rate so that uh, more people can benefit uh, more cost effectively. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe, maybe Thank you, one, more, two, one or two more questions, Leanne. Then yeah, we... one, one more question for you, Rory, or even you, Nilesh. Um, is there a best time of day to take statins? Question that Janet has asked. Well, they recommend taking them at night because it's slightly more effective, but I think the best time of day is the time when you will remember to take it. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. a good answer. Thank you. Um, a question for you, Nilesh. Are there alternative treatments for those who don't tolerate statins? Are there alternative? I think Rory has already sort of alluded to this. So uh, for those who genuinely can't to tolerate statins, I mean, my practice normally is if a patient comes to me with, with taking a statin who says they've got side effects, usually it's their muscle aches. We stop them for a while. I retest them against the statin again. And often, as Rory has said, it's nothing to do with the statin that caused the muscle aches in the first place and they don't get the symptoms again. So I want to be very sure that they're truly statin intolerant rather than just have some side effects which they attribute to statins. But if that happens and that's truly intolerant, then ezetimibe is a, is, 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 is a drug that reduces cholesterol, as Rory said, by about 15%. Uh, and the PCSK9 antibodies would be the ones if you, if you, if you, uh, that one would move to now, especially if you are substantially higher risk for secondary prevention. So that often now requires a lipid clinic. You know, it's, it's, a sort of, it's a quite an expensive drug. And so it's, the way it's used is often through advice from a lipid clinic. So there are alternatives available already for people, apart from, of course, from taking a healthy, healthy diet as well. Thank you. One of the points to bear in mind is how statins and indeed the PCSK9 antibodies work. Mm. So what the statins are doing is really tricking the liver cells into thinking, um, uh, where's all the you? Where's all the cholesterol? Um, and um, they they force the, the liver cells to make more LDL receptors. So if you've inherited 
um, familial hypercholesterolemia from one parent, uh, you might on average have half the number of LDL receptors on your liver cell surface. Um, if you give the statin, then you trick the liver cells into thinking, I need more cholesterol, and it doubles the number of LDL receptors on its surface. So it essentially turns a familial hypercholesterolemic person who's inherited from one parent into somebody who has a normal number of LDL receptors. If you've inherited it from both parents, then you don't have, it de depends how severely um, the genetic disorder is, but you, you don't have any LDL receptors. So the statin effect can be much smaller, um, although there does seem to be some effect. And the same would be true uh, for the PCSK9 inhibitors, that they would be most effective for someone who's only inherited it from, from one parent. Thank you. And one, one final question, Nilesh, before we close the event. How much money is the BHF currently funding into heart attack research? Do you know? Oh, gosh. Um, that's, it's, it's, it's quite a large number. I think currently, you know, we have a portfolio of research. We've done almost half a billion, 500 million pounds worth of research currently, the BHF, and about 40 million, I think, would be in directly into research into heart attacks. It's still a substantial amount of, of funding into heart attacks, really due to, all due to the generosity of the people who, who support us, really. So, so just to thank people on the call who, who generously supported us for this. But I think we're coming to an end, Leanne. I think that just to first of all say that those questions that we've not been able to answer, and there have been quite a few in the, in the in, that have been submitted, apologies in advance for that. We do have a heart helpline. So if you have a very specific question about your personal health or something, then please do, 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 do use the helpline for that purpose. Um, I wanted to finish by just one last poll question, if people wouldn't mind. So Leanne, you want to put up the last sort of question today, which is to really see if people have, I appreciated what we presented today in terms of understanding of the BHF research on statins. Um, do you have that question ready, David, or not? Yeah. Okay. Has this event increased your understanding of BHF research into statins? Perhaps people can just quickly answer that. Rory, you've done a great job. You know, encouraging. Thank you, thank you so much, so much for that, and and and, and I'm, I'm I'm pleased to see that 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 response. I mean, as I said at the beginning of the session, um, this is only really the starting stories and the work that Rory has done is only one part of the sort of BHF's success over the last sixty years. And we recently compiled a series of small narratives around the different areas of work where BHF funded research has had an impact. So if you're really interested in this, we will post on, 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 the, on, the, on, the, on the web or on the chat line in a moment, a, a link to places where you can see different areas of work that the BHF supported where it's really had an impact on patients' life. Uh, so the 60 success stories that we'll put on our website will be something I'll encourage you to visit. The, the next thing to do is to say that um, our next live and ticking event is, 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 is going to be in about in a month's time. I think in September, you'll receive an invitation for this. We'll be joined by another uh, leader or doyen of our, of our research community, Sir Mark de Yacoub, who many of you may know, he's a pioneer in, in the field of cardiac surgery and particularly heart transplantation in the UK. So Sir Mark de will be joining us, who is, a, who is also an ex-BHF professor. And, and finally, we need to thank all of you for attending today. Uh, particularly to thank Rory, Jan, and, and, and Regina for, 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 for their contributions. Um, and I hope that you've had an enjoyable uh, afternoon session today. So uh, with, with that, I think we'll wrap up at this point and, and see you again at the next, next uh, live and ticking event. Thank you, everybody. Bye.